Did you notice on your way in the razor wire fence that went all the way around the prison? Yeah, I did too. <laughs> and I can tell you something about that because on the other side of that fence, I imagine that the air is sweeter, that the weather is nicer, and my God, the food just has to taste better out there. <laughs> so I'm contemplating these things when suddenly after 15 years of staring at that fence, I have a small opportunity to get outside it, and I take off and I head for my hometown. Now, for those of you out there thinking that the first place they're going to come look for me is my hometown, well, you'd be right. You'd be right. Because we all know that it's that draw of familiar things. It's overpowering in an unfamiliar situation. So even knowing that, of course, I end up in my hometown and I find myself on a familiar street. And I'm breathing that nice, sweet, free air. And although I didn't see it, I can swear to this day that I think somebody was cooking French fries nearby. And looking around, there wasn't a fence in sight. But I knew, deep down, it was going to be one of the worst days of my life. You see, I didn't escape. I was there with the permission of the warden, and I was accompanied by a couple guards from the prison that drove me. I was in the parking lot of a funeral home, and I was about to view the body of my father. I had that somber feeling not just because he had passed, but because there were things I still needed to say to him. There was the typical father-son stuff, hurtful words said inside of heated arguments that was mostly immaturity on my part that we never cleared up. But the thing that wasn't typical was I never shared with him anything about my crime. I didn't tell him that as a parent there wasn't anything that he could or couldn't have done to prevent what happened. I didn't tell him that the life lessons he instilled in me growing up were the right ones and that my crime was a betrayal of those lessons. I didn't tell him that my crime was 100% my fault and I alone am accountable for it. I didn't want to face the embarrassment or the shame and I didn't have the courage to face the emotion that a talk like that would have provoked. So in all my conversations with him, and not just him, but everybody else I cared about too, there was this elephant in the room. And I liked that because it meant I didn't have to face my character failings or my cowardice. And I realized that if you leave that elephant there long enough, it becomes familiar. It becomes something that you don't tolerate as much as you don't perceive it anymore. Time will do that. My father became ill and passed very quickly, but that's just an excuse. I had 15 years to tell him these things, and it was too late. I realized standing beside my father's coffin that this couldn't happen again that it wouldn't happen again. I started having those hard conversations with the people I cared about, the ones you need to have to clear out the baggage, the ones you need to have to kill the elephants. I started valuing my relationships with people more than my own pride or comfort, and I started doing it that day. And it wasn't a day too soon because just months later, it was once again time to go outside the fence to see my mother. Saying goodbye to a parent is different for everyone. My journey started with a pair of handcuffs linked through a chain around my waist and ankle chains that limited my stride to about 20 inches. These would stay on the entire time and it made the circumstances very tough. But if there's one thing a decade and a half of incarceration will teach you, that it's really not in the circumstances, it's in your attitude. And I had a couple things to help me with that. First of all, this isn't a poor me speech. I'm not a victim here, and I refuse to be called one. All these circumstances were of my own making, and that sense of responsibility helped. Second, I was grateful for the opportunity. I've been given more opportunities since my incarceration than I deserve because I've denied those opportunities to other people through my selfish actions, being very grateful just to go helped. And speaking of opportunities, it's very rare to mix with the outside world, and one in my condition simply must take advantage of any opportunity they get. So I imagine dragging my chains through the crowded lobby and busy hallways of the hospital, making as many friends with the curious onlookers as my guards would allow. <laughs> How's everybody doing in here? <laughs> you going to finish that sandwich? Okay. All right. <laughs> 
wow, you are really pretty. I'd say call me, but my prison number's only got six digits. So. <laughs> but it was not to be as I was whisked up a back elevator to my mother's floor where the gravity of the situation took hold immediately. In my imagination, the white-tiled hallways and background noise and activity of the hospital was replaced with sound-deadening carpet and very few employees clustered around dimly lit workstations talking in hushed tones. It was the perfect, quiet, relaxing atmosphere that one would want in the last few days of their life. We enter my mother's room and I have one hour. We were emotional at first, but then our conversation centered on the fact that we really just were concerned about each other. She was worried about me, of all things, and I was worried about her. I wasn't concerned about her passing because both her and I are very strong in our faith, and I know I'll see her again. But I was worried about what my visit, how it would affect her. If you're in the hospital and family starts flying in from around the country, the news is pretty bad. If your son, who has been convicted of murder and is serving a life sentence, shows up in your hospital room with two armed guards, the news is the worst. If she hadn't accepted her situation by then, my visit had to have brought some sort of finality to her, and I was worried about that affecting her spirit. But it was a needless worry as she stayed bright and positive until she passed a few days later. What well, wasn't a needless worry was my concern for her pain. And halfway through our last hour together, she started getting sick. And I couldn't help. Everybody's helpless in the face of terminal cancer. I get that, but to not be able to put a cold washcloth on the forehead of the woman that did it for me so many times growing up, something I can't describe. Wouldn't wish on anyone. I was able to call for the nurse, and she came in with some medicine that would help, but it would put my mom to sleep. I only had a half hour left. Now, my mom, she suffered from chronic back pain her whole life, and she would drive two hours here to visit me, sit in that visiting room for hours, often in pain, and still have the two-hour drive back. Sometimes she could barely make it from the car to the house afterwards. And she visited me twice a month for 15 years. So I knew without a doubt that she would have toughed out that last half hour if we needed it. Because that's what good moms do. But it was time for me to be a good son. And tell her she should rest. I watched her sleep that last half hour. And I came back to the prison. See, we didn't need any more time to talk because mom and I had already had those hard conversations. I went to her deathbed physically in chains, but emotionally free. Emotionally free. For those of you that want to tear this talk down to one central theme, you're going to find it's nothing more than relationship advice. But I would implore you not to make it that simple because relationship advice is everywhere. We've got thousands of Facebook friends, We've got lonely strangers on empty buses. We've got pesky mother-in-laws. They all have relationship advice for you. <laughs> so why take relationship advice from a guy that has no ship and no crew but is still forced to dress like he's in the Navy every day? <laughs> <laughs> Here's why. If I can stand before you now a prisoner serving a life sentence, having lost so much in my life and being ever mindful of the things I've caused others to lose as well and tell you that my life is rich and it is full and it is blessed because I've chosen to have the hard conversations with my loved ones, I hope that would challenge you to think about some conversations that you might need to have because it is a fact of our lives that the people in them can be taken from us at any moment. And I simply share my story to tell you that you need to start having those conversations today. Thank you.